the Civil War was over. America was moving into an age dominated by cities and factories. Giant industries began to change the landscape and the lives of the American people. In less than half a century, they hurled the nation into the position of number one producer of manufactured goods in the world. Farming became a big business as it was caught up in an agricultural revolution. Time was when it took more than a week to take in our harvest. Me and my sons worked from dawn till dark, racing against the weather to get it all done. Now, I got a 30 horsepower steam driven reaper. Does the work of at least five men. America was a country on the move, building, growing, and turning out newfangled goods at top speed. Labor saving machinery and mass production made it all possible. And the railroads tied it all together. Now that the railroad passes through our town, a lot of things are changing. We can get store-bought tools, furniture, clothes, almost anything you can think of. And it's cheaper than ever before. Many Americans moved into the cities, where the bright white glitter of electric light made the rugged frontier seem dull by comparison. Goodbye, girls, I'm going to Boston. Goodbye, girls, I'm going to Boston. Goodbye, girls, I'm going to Boston early in the morning. I want to ride on a streetcar, a ferry boat, a carousel, and maybe take a spin in a horseless carriage. I want to move in crowds. I want to meet some millionaires. I want to see theaters and restaurants and midnight streets as bright as noon. I want to be where there's music and muscle, instead of watching the prairie fall asleep at sundown. Side by side with the movement from the farms into the cities, there was another great movement of peoples. Like a magnet, the dream of freedom continued to pull immigrants across the sea to America. The United States was a golden country, a paradise where I knew I could make pots of money, put polish on my boots and ate white bread every day of the week. Butcher, baker, candlestick maker, millionaire. Ha! In America, anything is possible. The nation had a winning combination. Rich natural resources, a huge labor force, and plenty of talent. There were geniuses with the vision to see and do what had never been imagined before. There were men such as Thomas Edison, who became the world's most famous inventor. For years, Edison pondered the problem of producing light from electricity. His biggest problem was finding something to put in the bulb that would give light when a current was run through it. I tried platinum, iridium, cotton, and cork. They didn't work. Then I used lemon peel, hemp, and paper. They didn't work. I even plucked the hairs from a friend's beard and tried that. It didn't work. I finally solved the problem by plucking the air out of the bulb. I had finally bottled light. Edison invented the phonograph and the mimeograph, and then went on to puzzle over the possibility of moving pictures. Between the Civil War and the turn of the 20th century, half a million patents were granted to other inventors. They revolutionized the way people lived and worked and played. Some of the new machines seemed like the inventions of madmen or comic book artists. Others were greeted with hoops of laughter. They soon became a permanent part of American life. Operator! Operator! like a fool talking to a piece of iron instead of a person. With the growth of industry and business, there were fortunes to be made. Many of the men who became the giants of industry started out poor, but they didn't stay that way for very long. One of them was Andrew Carnegie. I came to America when I was 13 because my family was starving in Scotland. My first job was a bobbin boy in a cotton factory. I made a dollar twenty a week. My first promotion put me in charge of the steam engines. I had to make sure they didn't blow up. I was so frightened that I would wake up at night in a cold sweat, twirling imaginary dials. But I never complained. My family needed the money too badly. 
Carnegie soon began running up the ladder of success. Messenger boy, telegraph clerk, secretary. He landed a job with the Pennsylvania Railroad and became a manager. Then, a superintendent. I got an inside tip on a hot investment and took a chance. I mortgaged my mother's house and made my first deal. It paid off. A shrewd Wheeler dealer, Carnegie made other investments with his profits. He dabbled in oil, coal, railroads, banks, and the thriving new telegraph business. By the time he was 27, he had a small fortune. I used my money to set up some iron companies. Then I realized that steel could be used for everything from steamships to skyscrapers to knives, forks, and railroad tracks. I said goodbye to the age of iron and welcomed King Steel with open arms. Carnegie soon controlled the young steel industry. It made him a millionaire many times over. And there were others. John D. Rockefeller grew up poor. His father peddled quack medicines when he wasn't hiding from the law. When he was home, my father used to make trades with me and cheat me every chance he got. He said he did it so I'd learn to be a sharp bargainer when I grew up. The lessons came in handy. When Rockefeller was in his 20s, his boss sent him to Pennsylvania to check out a new discovery, oil wells. Out on Oil Creek, I saw the black sticky glue that oozed out of the rich soil. It had been bottled and sold for 20 years as a cure-all for everything from backache and TB to constipation. A pale, bony, small-eyed, miserly man, Rockefeller quietly began to build his empire. I did some research and figured out that oil was the fuel of the future. He persuaded other men to invest in an oil refinery and soon was on his way to the top. You've got to clip all the buds on a rose bush to make one perfect rose. In business, you have to nip rivals in the bud to create an industrial giant like Standard Oil. I soon controlled drilling, refining, and delivery. I used my profits to buy lumber companies and manufacture barrels. Then I bought pipelines and made secret deals with the railroads to give me a lower price than anyone else. Soon, Rockefeller had driven his competitors out of business. The oil monopoly was born as the giant gobbled up the midgets. Rockefeller kept up his cautious, miserly ways, even when he became the world's first billionaire. I rarely saw him smile and never heard him laugh. The only time he got excited was when he'd struck a good bargain. Then he'd throw up his hat, kick his heels, and yell, I'm bound to be rich. The big tycoons began counting their millions, not by ones, but by fives, tens, hundreds. They showed off their wealth at glittering parties, where guests dug with tiny silver shovels for prizes of rubies, diamonds, and sapphires. The party tonight was so lovely, the dining room was like a garden filled with flowers. In the center of the table, under a cage of golden wires, swans were swimming in an artificial lake. While birds sang in golden cages, I heard all the latest gossip. One woman just bought her dog a diamond collar worth $15,000, and Papa says her husband gives out cigarettes wrapped in $100 bills. But below the upper crust of the new rich, there was a different America. A much vaster America of people struggling to make ends meet. Millions of men, women, and children could only scratch out a living with the meager wages they earned in factories, sweatshops, and coal mines. I learned to twist paper and wire into artificial flowers when I was four. I'm seven now and work in a factory 12 hours a day. I work in the sweatshop sewing dresses 10 hours a day and often take work home to get more money. Even with my husband and children working, we barely have enough to live on. They have a saying, go to market with a basket full of money and come back with hardly a pocket full of goods. The new factories demanded more and more workers. Many of them were young children. 
Young boys from age five on sit crouched over the coal chutes for more than ten hours a day. Their positions are so cramped that many of them become deformed, bent-backed like little old men. Clouds of dust choke the air and bring on lung disease. There's no attempt to make working conditions safe or healthy, just to make a profit. Most captains of industry didn't care much about working conditions and low wages. It was their industry and their factory, and they believed they could do with it as they pleased. To get the fullest advantage from our factories, we must make and sell our products in greater numbers than ever before. Only the strongest can survive in the cutthroat world of business. While this may be hard for the individual, it is best for mankind. It means that the poor can enjoy today what the rich never used to be able to afford. The luxuries of the past are the necessities of today. But many poor people were not impressed by this argument. Workers felt cheated out of the profits their work created. They realized they had to organize to fight for fair treatment. We must join together to fight for higher wages, fewer hours, and better working conditions. Even before the Civil War, workers had banded together. But these early unions were small and weak. Their strikes were easily crushed. As industry grew, working people began to flex their muscles more and more. In 1886, Samuel Gompers united workers from all over the country in the American Federation of Labor. I've been under the heel of big business since I became a cigar maker at 13. Let's show them we'll strike whenever we have to, to win our demands. We must get more wages, more power, more leisure. We want more today than yesterday and more tomorrow than today. Until we get our share of this country's wealth, we'll never give up. Strike followed strike as labor fought to win its demands. Many ended in defeat. It is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving midst the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. Some brought bloodshed and tragedy. Reformers, journalists and progressive politicians began to speak out. They tried to awaken the public to the problems of workers. The conscience of this age must work for the emancipation of the worker, just as it once struggled to free the slave. Man must not be treated as a thing hired to produce more things. A man must be hired as a man with a mind and heart, not just a set of hands. Gradually, labor won the rights the unions demanded. The lords of big business would never go unchallenged again. America kept on growing. More and more Americans began to benefit from the world's most massive economic machine. There was a new mood of hope mixed with pride. As poet Carl Sandburg wrote, The people, the family of man, wanted to put up something proud to look at. And the job got going. We are the greatest city, the greatest nation. Nothing like us ever was. The people have come far and can look back and say, we will go further yet. The people, yes, the people.